Hey everybody, welcome to Losing Your Mind with Chris Cosentino. I'm your host, Chris Cosentino. We are here to talk about people that inspire and all my guests are inspiring in so many different ways. And I'm really looking forward to digging deep into how they got to where they are, to the top of their game, how hard they've worked, how much they've given up and how they're giving back. So without further ado, here's our next guest. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Losing Your Mind with Chris Cosentino. I am here with the cycling superstar, Sarah Sturm, who has not only crushed, I don't know, let's see, one, two, three, four, five different events since I've <laughs> seen her, right, at, at Oregon Trail. Um, how you doing? Oh, super fresh. <laughs> <laughs> Just, a little tired. Honestly, people ask me, and I'm like, super. I feel super. <laughs> you just got finished with the uh, best last ride, right, in Montana. How was that? Yes. Oh my God, what an event! I, um, yeah, that was like the most serendipitous, perfectly timed thing. At first, when I was like flying out there, because it was kind of a bit of an emotionally charged week leading up. Um, I was pretty, I was pretty smoked. Honestly, just like mentally, I was like, I cannot believe I'm getting on a plane right now. Also, thank God I was getting on a plane and not driving a million hours basically to Canada, um, which Allison and Blaze did. So good on you guys. (laughs) But I was just, yeah, it was such a cool weekend. Like it just rained the entire time and like (laughs) cleared up as everyone was finishing and it was beautiful and it was so cool, but yeah. Oh my God. It's been a wild, like couple months. <laughs> so we hung out at Oregon trail, which was during the heat wave, right? Like there was yes. a moment when you and I were riding from the finish down to our camp zone where it was 112 oh, yeah. and the car was boiling up through the pavement. So from that event, which was a five day stage race, you have done the, Let's see, you've done the rift in Iceland, right? Yeah. You did you yeah. won lead boat, mm-hmm. which is redonkulous. Granted, you're in Durango, so you have the elevation benefit, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Last best ride. I mean, I'm sure I'm missing a bunch of events in the middle there, but you did a lot. You've been busy. Busy. It's it's all so I feel I truly like I remind myself like this is a crazy life. This is insane. I get to do this. Like, cause sometimes it doesn't feel fun. And I talked to my therapist about that. And like, I was like sitting in the chair and I was like, just like, I'm going to, I'm going to cry. I have a really stressful job. And I was like, I don't think I've like actually let myself say that. Cause it feels so, it like feels a little whiny, you know? Cause like I get to go race my bike around the world, which is so cool and it's something I've wanted to do for so long but I was like it's so stressful I'm so I'm so tired (laughs) so that's actually a really good point and I think there's a perception versus reality when it comes to what people are doing in their in their life whether it is being a chef because everybody assumes that everybody in my house eats the most amazing food all the time ask my wife all the time (laughs) it's other one um (laughs) But they also think that being a professional athlete is, you know, it's easy. There's this magic silver bullet that gets you to that level. I mean, you work really, really hard to get where you are now. I mean, you have a degree, you, you live in Durango, you made a conscious choice to be in Durango, and you've really accomplished a great deal of things. But the most important thing for me, which I think makes a lot of people gravitate towards you is that the infectious level of fun and smile you always bring to the events no matter how shit ass we're all feeling you make us laugh you make everybody smile and you're still having fun no matter how much you hurt and i think that's really really important yeah thanks oh that's gonna make me cry No, it's so, it's, it it really is such a good, I mean, well, gosh, if you're not able to do that, and this is, you were, you met my mom, you see what a huge influence. Uh, Also, this is why we're having this conversation because of my mother 
and the human being that she is and you know she was such a huge I mean she's why I am the person I am and she has always said like if you are not able to laugh at yourself to have fun I mean with anything like it, it doesn't matter if we're talking about you know a, a desk job or whatever like if you're not able to enjoy it and and bring joy to people's lives like why the hell would you be doing it because everything is hard we are collectively as a global community having a pretty hard time right now yeah <laughs> we're, having, that's an we're having a hard time you know and i don't want to necessarily like, we don't have to go into every reason why everything is very challenging and and pretty um uh pretty shitty <laughs> But that's, it, it, it helps me at least remember like at these events, like this is a bike race. We're trying, we're trying to cross the finish line here. We're trying to end where we start. So that is like this level of ridiculousness that like when I start taking it too seriously, I'm like, okay, we're literally riding in a big freaking loop. <laughs> like it doesn't, we're, not even, we're not even like getting somewhere. Like it's just this thing that the, that we have put importance on and and truly the the important part at least to me is like and the coolest piece for me is like getting to meet people like you you know bring my mom into it like introduce people to you know at these events and then also get to meet new people like it's a weird like traveling circus so like if you're not making friends you're gonna have a pretty shitty time you're going to be, what's the like, what's the sad part of the, I've never been to a circus because I'm too sensitive for that, but. <laughs> I think the shit shoveler is usually the sad yeah. part. The That's the poor guy that has to wear the, the onesie that is very, you know, onesies are cool. Let me get. Onesies, me get are, cool. onesies, are, onesies are cool. Uh, but like that poor guy has to shovel elephant shit all day. He's pretty. <laughs> cool. so, um, so let's, let's kind of. Yeah. Veer off the bike a little bit. I mean, you've really. You studied design. You have a really, really unique eye. And I think, you know, it's really apparent with the Rafa collab for your kit. Yeah. The bike collab that you've done with Specialized. <laughs> um, it's pretty amazing that, and you're seeing people now buying this kit and wanting a, a matching frame to yours. Like, how does that feel being a designer and having such great response? Yeah, man, it's so like totally on the design side. I'm like, man, how crazy like all of my different worlds because I like raced through college and like as I was studying design, like, you know, now all of it's like weirdly perfectly come together mm -hmm. and like meshed together. And it's it's so wild to see people like in the kit that you know, Rafa, I got to work with their designers to like make this cool thing. And it's funny to see like both men and women wearing this, like, I mean, you should have seen some of the iterations we went through. Cause like Rafa is like pretty, like they do their thing. And like, and I was just like, but I love color <laughs> and patterns and we'll just put it all on one. <laughs> You're like, we just want a band on the arm. <laughs> Just the band. That's it. Oh my god! Like, I, hope, band. I hope they're like, yeah. So we're gonna let you go. <laughs> Have some fun. This is your last season. <laughs> but I mean, it's too but, much pink for us. <laughs> yeah, but talk about like, I mean, to me that the excitement level and the amount of people who have gravitated towards your kit and yeah, cool. the amount of people that want the same paint scheme as your frame is huge. Yeah. Right. It's awesome. Yeah, I was so, it, it's been really, really special to like see the impact of like art and and design and, and just like the fun that you can have with it. Cause like, I don't know, bikes are such a cool medium for that and like kits, it's, it's fun to like see it all together. And honestly, Oregon Trail was like the first time that we got to see like, I mean, that was the first race I had done on that. That was crazy. They shipped, they overnighted all of my like, the frame to a bike shop in Bend because like it was it was like up against the wire I was like yeah let's do a custom frame and and there I was like but I'm doing this race like they're like oh yeah, yeah no problem and it was just like crazy like we were shipping my parts from Durango to this shop and the frame from Specialized to this bike shop and I was like calling them like 
I apologize. This is not how I usually do these things. Like <laughs> they were laughing at me, I'm sure, and cursing me at the same time because, you know, I'm sure they weren't busy at all. Bike shops have like. But they've been really slow this this past few years. They've been really slow bike shops. <laughs> they got nothing going on. No parts shortage. No, no, no. And like before a race, you know, everyone is showing up with like a clapped out bike and like, hey, can you pr- replace my brake pads? Yeah. <laughs> Which was me last weekend, apparently. Oh my God. To- ah. <laughs> I've had to do that. I, my brake pads were toast after Oregon Trail because oh. of the dust. Oh, gone. yeah. Drivetrain. New chain, new cassette toast. Well, you be, I mean, you're a tall guy. Like you, you guys put some power down and like Dylan, my partner, he's six, six. And I don't know what guys weigh, but like more than a hundred pounds. <laughs> it's yes. double, I'm, double, yeah. <laughs> I'm assuming like 101. <laughs> what? Hang on a second. No, I'm just kidding. Hi, my name's Chris. <laughs> <laughs> If you cut me in half, yeah. Yeah, I would be hundred one side, hundred the other. <laughs> but yeah, you guys, I mean, you guys just go through, like Dylan goes through like five drivetrains in a season and I'm like on the original, ch- like you guys just put more wear and tear. Going back to my point, it's more efficient to be a small person. <laughs> sure, you can reach the top shelf, but like I am still on the original chain. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> like I'm ecologically sound. You're not. <laughs> yes. Although I'm pretty convinced I eat more than Dylan. That's possible. I mean, the amount of output you're doing, I would definitely <laughs> wouldn't be surprised. You know, you probably Although he kicked my ass in Iceland. It was his first ever like endurance gravel race. He went for one four hour ride the day before we left and crushed me. Oh it also was God. flat as shit. <laughs> I mean, so let's talk about when you were at school, right? You, yeah. your road to where you are now is not what everybody would have realized, right? Uh, talk about your Devo experience. You're, do you have your baseball card to show everybody? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I love this. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, wait, do I have the original ones? Oh, this isn't self-absorbed at all. Oh, yeah, let me just grab them. They're right here. I've got all my pictures right of myself right here. Yeah. From, uh, oh, you mean these? <laughs> So to kind of give everybody a little bit, Devo is an awesome organization yeah. in Durango that has, I would say, created a whole slew of superstars on the bike right now. I um, mean, who are your teammates? Yeah, you, let's, so, okay. Then, yeah, well, wait, hold on. Okay, so Durango, I chose to go to college there because um, I wanted to play soccer. Well, I thought I wanted to play soccer. That worked out well for me. <laughs> Didn't even make it to the tryouts. Um, <laughs> Ooh, that's I, a fun, that's a cool toy. Look at that bike. Yeah, yeah, I was like, squirrel. <laughs> yeah, squirrel. That was fun. Um, yeah, I just, by luck, chose at the time the top ranked cycling collegiate team in the country but it was you know it was like three hours away from where I grew up in Albuquerque and my parents were getting a divorce at the time so I wanted to be far enough but like also pretty close and Durango was perfect and it was a small liberal arts college I actually didn't know what I wanted to study pretty sure I wanted to go into oceanography was my first class so you know landlocked that's a perfect example of something to study landlocked (laughs) <laughs> hey we're in Durango where's the ocean <laughs> I don't know <laughs> <laughs> so to all you college kids out there <laughs> <laughs> I know my poor parents actually you know what I had looked into CIA because I really was into culinary arts and um I was really stoked on baking and I wanted to I wanted to be a pastry chef um but then I decided to go to school in the mountains because I was like just something drew me I really want to be a rock climber I loved ice climbing and I didn't do either of those things and then I was like oh I could play soccer because that's you know what I was coming from and then I joined the bike team fast forward there's a 
Durango um, junior cycling program called Durango Devo started by Sarah Tesher and Chad Cheney. And when I was graduating college, I was kind of getting more into mountain biking. I was truly the worst person on the team. Like the one who Chad at like one of our, okay, wait, hold on. That's another story. But yeah, I like really like stuck to it. I sucked. I was like the person who walked over speed bumps because I was scared to go over them with my road bike and couldn't get my like water, bi- water bottle out of my water bottle cage. I was not good. And for I mean, everybody out there to kind of put this in perspective, I can never picture this as this. <laughs> talk to Chad. Okay. Because <laughs> Sarah has blown by me. Like I'm standing still <laughs> on descents. Like, and I'm not afraid to go downhill by any you could. <laughs> And just out of the blue, I hear, oh. right? And they're just, boom, there she goes <laughs> in that Rafa kit. Wow. I'm like, oh, <laughs> crap. And I was moving. So to hear you say that you would have oh, gotten off the bike for a speed bump on the road is shocking to me. Because everybody oh. progresses, but that I would never expect. Progression was... I don't know what, I don't know. I was a lot younger. I was like 18, 19. So you're like, yeah, I want to do this. And also the main driver of everything in my life are the people. So like I met my group of friends and they all rode bikes. And so I was like, well, shit, I guess I better learn how to mountain bike. And I was so bad. I was so bad, but I do have like a natural ability to suffer. So I I like weirdly love suffering. And I, I think I always have liked that and so like when I started like doing you know cycling instead of like swimming and track like track and soccer like those are all pretty short things you know like with with mountain biking I was like oh well I can go uphill so I would speed past everyone on the climbs and then just hold everyone up on the dis- <laughs> and I think and, suffering oh. is such a and I think there's solace in suffering right like there's that moment yeah. of like getting through it and there's an end to the means right you're pushing yeah. to get to that end and I think it's a really powerful thing yeah it's cool like I I imagine like I'm not I I have way too much ADD to meditate I think but the form of meditation for me comes from I you just get into this like weird place of like like my concept of time goes out the window because it has to like you don't start Leadville 100 thinking okay only seven to ten more hours <laughs> you know like you can't think about the end at all and I think that's the only piece that I like was comfortable with with all of you know my intro to cycling and then I got onto this team called the Durango Devo Sweet Elite because we were sponsored by the Rocky Mountain Chocolate Factory and Chad Cheney was our coach so that was hilarious and he is like such a great like you know personality for that like he really there's a saying with Durango Devo NFTF never forget the feeling I mean and it's been it's been said by now Olympians Tour de France stage winners you know the kids that Chad brought up through the sport and it's it's so true like you never forget the feeling of riding a bike with your friends and and that was kind of the ethos is the ethos of Devo so when I got onto this like uh mountain bike team this pro team I was lining up I mean I I was traveling around the country with Howard Gratz with Sepp Kuss with Pace and McElveen like we had I mean Teal Stetson Lee was on that team like the roster of names like it's un it's unreal and it's it's funny that we were all on this like like rocky mountain chocolate factory mountain bike team <laughs> from that sets you guys all up for success i mean it created a one a bond mm-hmm. two it taught you to love the sport yeah right? like you kept saying it's about that fun factor right don't forget yeah. the fun and i think there's something about that moment when you're a kid and you first get on a bike and you can go as far away, farthest away from your parents than you have ever been able to go, right? Yes. It, and there's that freedom and there's something yeah. magic about that. Mm-hmm. It's cool. It, I mean, and, and don't get me wrong, like there were plenty of tears shed <laughs> for, for me. Like, you know, my 
now very, very close friend, Lauren Catlin. She's, she's since, you know, just become like a wildland firefighter and, you know, has a PhD in biology. Like she's a badass in a different way, but she and I were like on this team together. We were roommates at the time. and We were just getting like last and second to last at all these like short track races <laughs> and just <sighs> crying and honestly i i wouldn't trade it because you know it's it's a part of like <laughs> when you get to like the pro level too like you have to go through all of that like i quit after because i was you know i remember dylan asking me after a race like i had you know moved on from sweet elite i was on another local pro team and came back from you know getting smashed at some mountain bike race and he was like are you having fun <laughs> and i was like I don't think so. I don't No, I don't think so. I like all the other parts, but I don't know if I like the racing. And so I quit and then I got a trail bike and mountain biking was fun for me. Like I actually started learning how to ride a mountain bike, not just like, Oh, are you scared? Get your weight back. <laughs> Crash around every flat turn. <laughs> and then, and then after that, like I came back uh, to cycling, I was like, all right, I kind of want to race. I've always loved cyclocross. Um, so, and we saw that single speed worlds, which sounds serious, but it's actually like equal parts party to racing. Like you have oh, to, yeah. you have to be able to take a whiskey shot while you're racing is kind of like mm -hmm. how I explain that. And we saw it was in Portland. So we we're like, hell yeah, perfect goal race. My friend at the time, like super close friend of mine is like a badass coach. And I was like, yo, you want to coach me for single speed worlds? <laughs> and he was like, wow, way to pick a serious race. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, he was like, yeah, no intervals were had. You know, he was just like, kind of gave me this like new way of like training and prepping, which was just enjoying riding a bike, learning some more technical skills. I raced in jorts as like a reminder to myself that like I was choosing to be there I wanted to have fun the goal of this was to have fun and yeah it's just been kind of a wild ride ever since then <laughs> and I think I mean is that going to be the new Rafa kit for you are you going to have jorts made Rafa you know what it did when I was like talking to them like initially about signing I was like well I like to race cross and jorts are you guys cool with that what did they say <laughs> They're like, yeah, but it's you like do it. <laughs> you want to get you want a good laugh. So there used to be 24 hours of Canaan, and it was how I really started mountain bike racing was doing that. But there was a team called Huge Ass. <laughs> right? H U G H J A S S. <laughs> right? So and they were a team that rode fixed gear mountain bikes. Now I don't know if you ever remember the what? Carrera team. You remember the Carrera team? And they were sponsored by Wrangler Jeans or Carrera, whatever. But they had denim looking shorts. Do you remember that? It, Pantani was on. No. The they basically shared a pair. They wore one pair of shorts and shared it through the whole team. By the end of this, the end of the 24 hour race, they had to use a dead tube to tie the shorts on to keep them up. <laughs> And they literally would change in the baton tent where they would change the baton. It was the gnarliest thing. Can you imagine wearing some shorts? Oh my Nothing God, I love them. That so They much. literally were butt naked, switching into these jean shorts. <laughs> it was gnarly. Oh but my God, that's amazing. so gross. They were, they were the most amazing, fun team to watch. Again, on six cool. gears in Canaan, all mud, rocks, roots. They were the gnarliest. I don't understand how you would do that. I don't either, but this was like, I'm talking 94. This was in 94 they were doing it. Gnarly. It was, it was insanely awesome. Like super fun. Like that's. And probably on like what we just, what we raced at Oregon Trail. <laughs> the bikes we raced. Oh, like pretty much. <laughs> oh man. It was crazy time watching those guys ride. Super. That's fun. so cool. This is why I love cycling. Like there's so many weird and like, I get like at some point, like it turns people off because they're like, what is cyclocross? What is gravel? What is not like, there's yeah. so many different like weird little niches, but it's cool. Like you get to kind of pick your poison. Like, are you 
a weirdo that likes the party to race, you know, scenario, maybe cyclocross is for you. Or do you like walking your bike uphill? Maybe mountain biking is for you. <laughs> <laughs> so you, last year, you did a crazy, and to kind of talk about that variation, you know, you won BWR. That was like, you yeah. got thrust into the limelight yeah. when you won BWR. Everybody's like, oh my God, like <laughs> this woman is the singles, single speed cyclocross champ, <laughs> came out of nowhere, mountain biker. <laughs> Sarah Stern, I remember seeing and I've watched the video because it was super funny to watch. I mean, <laughs> you look shelled when you finish, like completely, absolutely friggin' shattered. Yeah. Okay. And I think it's really interesting, like that was a, like that kind of threw you through the stratosphere after BWR. And oh, how did that yeah. feel going from that level of fun racing that you had switched to because you wanted to race for fun and have the, you know, I, I, I think the, that FKT concept of funnest known times, right? Is oh, way more yeah. styled than fastest known times, but yet like your fastest known times are still really fast. So you kind of get to slash them both together and have fun and be fast. Yeah. How did that feel to get from wanting to be the fun aspect mm -hmm. to all of a sudden, holy shit, you smoked everybody at BWR and now you're like, everybody's just- Yeah, you know, dude, that's a, that is such a, I'm so glad you asked that question because it is probably like the hardest thing now, now for me, 2021, <laughs> where are we? Um, it's, it's a tough, it's a tough line to walk. Cause like, yeah, BWR was like, I mean, they, my cross team had just folded, you know, like, which was a bummer. Cause like, you know, it was my first year racing as a sponsored athlete, like truly like, you know, from specialized sponsored. And then they were like, well, we're not going to do that, but like, we'll put you on our gravel team and here's a bike. It looks kind of the same <laughs> as a cross bike. <laughs> And then go to do this, about different. You know, they were like, do this gravel race. And I was like, what the hell? Okay. I've never even ridden that far. And I, I didn't understand. Cause like, you know, it was like a weird mix of like, it's a gravel race, but people wear road shoes and you have front train rings and you know, a bunch of stuff that I didn't really know. I mean, they were like, this is how you shipped the front derailleur with like the two. <laughs> that. That is priceless. So going from the day before the race, <laughs> the middle of the race, this is how you do this. What? I was like, oh, and, and <laughs> actually when I got uh, ETAP for my, um, your access for my cross bikes, I thought that's how you shifted easy still. And cross bikes don't really, most of them, at least mine don't have a front derailleur. So I was like shift hard with my right hand. And then I went to go shift easy with both hands and Dylan is my partner is also my mechanic which let me tell you don't recommend that dynamic for a relationship <laughs> I was like Dylan it's not shifting I was like it doesn't shift like there's something wrong I don't know and then we figured out that I was stupid and I was trying to shift easy the wrong way also for you guys listening you shift hard with your right hand easy with your left hand but there's not easy hard way. easy hard <laughs> And it makes it, you know, what's great about that. It's like, I'm dyslexic. That's the only reason I I'm able to use shifting. I had to discontinue using Shimano oh. because of my dyslexia. And I would always miss shift. Always. Whoa. I never Wait, was in how, does, how do you do Shimano shifting? I didn't, I couldn't, I was awful. I literally stopped using gears and started racing single speed because of my dyslexia, because I would never. I, I bet. Well, and now like sometimes, and this is maybe, maybe I'm dyslexic. I don't know, but uh, I'll, instead of shifting easier, I'll hit my dropper post. Cause it's also. <laughs> I still, I have one of it's those. It's cool guys. I'm a pro. <laughs> <laughs> I still, I have a dropper post, but I'm still like, Oh, dude, you got to use it. You're a tall guy. What a real seat post back in. Oh, there. you are one of those OG. I'm a hardtail steel guy. I know. You dude, hardtail with the dropper post is literally the most fun bicycle. Okay, ever. we'll 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 have that my <laughs> conversation on the bike when you and I can goof around and maybe you can. I know. I cannot wait. I can't wait. Oh yeah, but back, so, fun. 
So <laughs> let's get back to this conversation yeah, about so, that being thrown so into yeah, the stratosphere. I finished, I finished BWR only because it was such chaos at the start that I didn't, I literally didn't, I thought I was losing for like more than 50% of that race. Like I had no idea where any of the women, like you have, a, it's a mass start, you know, like everyone, I think it was my first like mass start race too. Like you're with men, with women, there's like thousands of people. It's an open California highway. It was so scary. It was so scary. And then they send you around a cone, do a U-turn. Oh yeah. 2000 people do a U-turn around a cone <laughs> and then you file into single track. And I was like cycle cross and like running like with my bike <laughs> and probably passed like a bunch of dudes and, and ended up, you know, weirdly winning that race. Um, which truly was like just as surprising to me as it was to everybody else. And like, I heard, like I crossed the finish line and I was like, heard the announcer like, and <laughs> looking through their pages, like Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> you were not prepared for that. No, I was like, yeah, it's sick. And then, and then, yeah, after that, that was a big, that was a, uh, a big win because people were like, who the hell is this? And I, you know, won a crit at Sea Otter on my gravel bike the week before. Yeah. The week before or something. Oh, truly, purely out of fear. Once again, I was terrified of crits. I hadn't raced one since college and just like went off the front and no one chased me down. because one, who the hell is this chick? Two, she's on a gravel bike. Like she'll come back. <laughs> anyway. So like, but what did, what did that do? Like how much did that change everything? So, yeah. Yeah. And I think that's really important because, you know, you worked really hard to get there. Things yeah. don't happen for an accident. Like it's not just right. a Let me... that happens. So I think it's, it's really important because yes. there's a lot of young ladies that look up to you. There's you know, you mentor kids in Durango, you mentor a whole yeah. slew of women, but they all, there are so many people that look up to you and say, how did she yeah. get, that? how did she do it? Because, you know, little kids, they always want to, yeah. they're, they're heroes. And I think it's really important that they understand how much work time and energy you put yes. in. Thank you. Cause, okay. Along with like people not knowing who the hell I was, it's not like I was new to the sport. Like I have been riding consistently a lot like prioritizing it in my life through desk I mean I've had nine to fives I've had like my my professional career as a graphic designer was also going on at the time like through all of this so like you know when I was talking about like speed elite like I had just gotten my first design job in Durango luckily and like you know I was adjusting to working 40 hours but I always rode my bike a ton like I would I was still coaching I I wasn't like new, like, it's not like I showed up to BWR, like, what's well, a bike? Like, sure, I'm an idiot and don't know how to shift things. But like, <laughs> I had been riding and racing a lot. Like I had, I had a lot of time spent on bicycles. And like, actually, like, you know, I, I had been doing like, enduros, which is, my mom called me when I was like doing my first enduro, and I was trying to explain what they were. And this is on a mountain bike, a trail bike. And, and I, she was like, okay, so let me get this straight. The timing, you ride uh, all day, but they don't time the climbs. They only time the, aren't you bad at the descents? Like, why are they only timing the descents? <laughs> so they're timing the thing you're bad at. <laughs> and I, I mean, I've lost a lot. I, I'm pretty sure I was last place at an EWS in Rotorua, New Zealand, which for the record, I had no business being there at that race, but I, you know, I, I, I've raced a lot of different bikes and like had a lot of different experiences. I just now am starting to finally come in. I, I timed it perfectly. You know, this, this genre of riding that isn't road racing, it's not mountain biking, it's endurance gravel racing, which is like a weirdly perfect combination for my abilities of like suffering for many hours being technical enough to like suit me but not so technical so it's not like a EWS that you know you have to be able to huck a gap jump to be competitive <laughs> but I let me say I'm really good at running <laughs> 
with a trail bike and a full face. <laughs> <laughs> I would love to see a picture of that. I think that's amazing. And and I will like also I want to like just put this in there. Like I, you know, Dylan is the opposite type of cyclist to me in that he is a competitive enduro racer. Like he wins the events that I get last at. And so we would sign up for like the Trans BC Enduro, which is like a six day gnarly enduro event. And I like being competitive. I like being in those environments, even though I was like at the back of the pack and I never looked at a result it, because that took the fun out of it for me. And I had this moment where like everyone, I felt like everyone had hit the, and they're blind. Like you don't get to pre-ride anything. There was this gap step up jump at the end of the day. It's like, we've done eight hours of riding and racing at that point. And it's like the last stage and people are like drinking beer. And there's this like terrifying feature that I like had no, like I had no confidence going on. And, you know, Dylan was like, just don't break. And I was like, cool, that's not helpful at all. I I'm going to break at the last worst possible moment and like probably endo into the pit where you're like jumping over so I like ran around mortified so embarrassed filled my like goggles up with tears got on the bike crossed the line went straight into like the you know the hotel room and I was just like like I don't deserve to be here and I just had this like weird moment of like all right I could either I'm going to be last. I'm probably going to be last at the, this is not the thing that I am naturally good at, but I can either be last and have a pity party and try to convince everyone how shitty I am and like how I don't deserve to be here. Or I can be last and have a ton of fun and meet some people. And that was like a really important moment for me as a human and as a bike racer and as a bike rider and as you know someone's partner too like that was a fun event for Dylan and I didn't want to take away from that and I think that that has served me really well going in to you know thrust into this life of gravel racing because like I, I've been really bad at stuff too I've known what that feels like and now I can really appreciate like the hard work, like I, I train a ton, like I work really hard to, to be where I'm at, but I also have to, ba- I have to balance that out with other things in my life. Cause I, I am not Olympic material in that. I can't just solely focus on just being an athlete. I like having a career as a graphic designer. I like mentoring kids from, you know, the design program at Fort Lewis onto their next careers. I like having that even though it adds so much more chaos and busyness to my life like it helps me maintain what you were exactly getting at at the beginning of this convert or this question five hours ago before I started talking about it (laughs) but it all like plays into that piece because it's really hard for me to find that balance sometimes like sometimes I notice that I like I want to win Leadville. Like I want to have that level of focus, but like, where is that line? Because having fun and being a good role model is so, so important to me. And I can only do that by sticking true to like who I am as a person. And it's really hard to remember who you are as a person through, you know, chasing something you're passionate about because you can get pulled in a lot of different directions, which is why I need some downtime. Cause it's hard when you're like in the circus to see what, you know, cause you're like top step of the podium. That's what matters. And it isn't all you kids out there. <laughs> well, I think that's actually really, you know, the, let's talk about Wahoo frontiers and that documentary they yeah. did, which I think is really great because it shows all the different things that you do, right? It showed your design, but it showed the kids that you work with. You're constantly mentoring young lady. Yeah in cycling and it's super fun like they it's so funny (laughs) they're funny and they're excited but like you are that bright light to them that brings the moths to the to the light right and I think that that's and I hate to use that analogy but it's like you really you're that beacon for them and because you keep the fun level so high but and but also you teach them to understand success failure determination uh, and, and love for the outdoors. 
And I think those and, are- And each other, you know, I think the biggest thing, you nailed it, like the biggest thing riding with the kids, it honestly, like, I mean, skills wise, they all <laughs> blow me out of the water. Like, honestly, I'm like, wait at the next turn. <laughs> <laughs> And what's the age? I think that's really like a really interesting so, thing. I mean, I've coached like junior Devo. I've coached U14. Um, like when I was in college, I coached the younger kids, <laughs> mainly because there was no way I was going to be able to keep up with the older ones. And, and now I, I really love coaching U19, um, which is, you know, basically from like 16 to 18, um, like until they go to college, if they choose to go to college. And then um, I help out with the college cycling team as well. And I love, I love that age. Cause they're all like, they are just on the brink of like, you know, kind of starting to figure out like who they are as individuals in the world. And like, man, I, it just brings back so many memories of like how hard it is to be like, I mean, I can only speak to like being a teenage girl and, and it's tough to like find friends and finding friends in sport is also super hard. Like I, you know, my best friend and I always played soccer together and she was way more talented than I was. And I remember how painful, how painful that was. Like it was so hard and like, and we maintained our, I mean, she's my best friend to date. Like she lives in uh, Nashville and, and we weathered a lot together and that's the thing that I like, I feel like I actually can speak to with these girls. Like, okay, like, yeah, sure. All this drama is happening and these boys and like so-and-so won, but I was like, you got to stick in it together. You know, like you girls are the only ones who understand how it feels to finish this race. So like lean on each other, like support each other, like stay at the end of the race. If you win, you cheer on the person, you know, your teammate who's getting 10th, 15th, last, I don't care. Like that's the, that is the hardest part of being a teenager, I think is understanding like how to, how to have friends and like how to support each other. And these kids are incredible. Like they're, yeah, they're, it's, it's like by far like the coolest part of the things that I do. That's awesome. Well, I, I have to say like, you know, we're out there racing in, or, I mean, you were racing in Oregon. I was, we were all racing in Oregon. <laughs> it was, it was kind of like a race of attrition for myself. Yeah, but for I, all of us. You know, I think the, the, that mentality that you're bringing to those girls is what you are bringing to everybody at Oregon. Yeah. You were cheering on everybody. You were making everybody feel good. And I think that that's a really, really powerful message to teach because it's sportsmanship, it's camaraderie. Yeah. And I think there needs to be more of that in sport. Uh, yes. You want to, yeah. you know, perfect example, you and Serena duking yeah. it every day, but then yeah. after, like, did you biff that corner? Because that corner was really, you know, and it's like, that conversation piece for me was really fun to see it from the outside. Yeah. And that, yeah, that relationship I, was just awesome. I mean, it was cool. Yeah. I'm, I'm so glad you brought that up. Serena and I have known each other for a long time now, but only in the last couple of years through gravel, you know, we've gotten to like really bond and connect and through COVID, you know, we, as everyone was, we were both having a really hard time with, you know, just, aspects of being a human being but also a bike racer and trying to figure out like what to do and you know we connected on some like you know mental health stuff and bounced ideas of therapists to work with and you know like I I think all of that going into a race together and like you know she and I were competing you know on multiple stages with the next to fiercely each other. fiercely let me put yes it in there. and it was tight like we were seconds on the GC and, um, you know, we have like similar strengths, but like, I would say she's a much stronger descender and a much better technical rider. And I'm a little bit better of a climber, at, you know, but she does really well in the heat and like, but then we were like, how much food are you bringing? Are you doing a pack today? Like, yeah. what are you wearing? <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that I think sharing, was... But also sharing food, like what you brought to that event and the community. I mean, my, that was like, highlight my the reason my mom came with me is like we were planning a road trip when COVID happened like she and I she took my sister to Europe my sister's maybe a little smarter I'm like let's go in a bus across the country in a heat wave <laughs> but that was that was a special time for my mom and I and actually we camped out in the bus in Serena's 
ma parents driveway before the race like serena helped connect us you know with her and then my mom is a, a she makes jewelry she's a metalsmith she gave serena's mom a pair of handmade earrings and like it just was like everything was like so beautifully coming together and then when we met you and you were like cooking for us and gave us this beautiful knife that I'm terrified to use because it's so awesome and sharp and great um you know it was all like sharing stories around you know the table the camp table the bus your van food and like all of you know Serena and I like eating out of like truly like probably not even talking about the race in fact never I don't think we really talked about the there was race. a lot of talk <laughs> about tire pressure and are you riding? don't ever forget and Henry that. just setting up my tires <laughs> Henry too much your tires are too too <laughs> he didn't even tell me he was like your tires are fine go yeah yeah he so, went, thank like, you. <laughs> which was amazing <laughs> To, the, to date, I don't even know what PSI I ran for Oregon Trail. I mean, he's the master. Like, I, I reached out to him because I have an event this Oh, week it's hugely year. important. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I should know what I'm... I think it was 28. I think it was. I think he did keep telling you 28. I do recall that. <laughs> I, th- I think that was the number. So, speaking of food, right, let's talk about, you know, that was one big discussion that we kept having at Oregon, like... What yeah. am I eating? Why can't I continue to eat on the bike? And mm-hmm. there was a lot of debate on you need to eat more and you need to eat this and don't eat that because it's going to hurt you yes. later. And yeah, like you, you just were in Iceland. Phew. And you had some interest. <laughs> I was pushing you to have okay coffee fried puffin. Okay. With- I thought you were joking until Peter Stetna at the end. We had been there for over a week at this point. He was like, yo, we're going to go try to find Puffin. And I was like, wait, I thought Chris was joking. Nope. I was and not we had just come from Puffin Island. It's not called Puffin Island. That's just what I called it. It it's was, a bird. Oh it's a bird God. that lives there. I mean, if you think about it, every every culture has Wait, their animals, but it's a very cute bird. So are quail. So are quail. <laughs> right? I mean I don't have pictures of quail on my camera. <laughs> well, I did send you a good picture to make you not like puffin as much. <laughs> So you would try one. <laughs> oh my God. So then it became this whole thing. I was like, okay, I have to do this for Chris. Like we have to find Puffin. So then we end up trying to go to this super fancy restaurant and we like walk in and like our, like, you know, we had just <laughs> been in Iceland for a week camping and then did this like heinous race. So we look pretty haggard, I'm sure. And we like a group of like six walk into this restaurant and we're like, can we have a table? We want to try the puffin. And they're like, yeah, no, you needed a reservation for like weeks. So then we find this like authentic Icelandic restaurant that serves like all these dishes. Puffin was not one of them because apparently that's like a fancier Icelandic dish, but they did have fermented shark. Uh, The videos that I saw, uh, (laughs) it was Meredith that was there with you, right? (laughs) Of her trying to hold it down and desperately (laughs) begging for alcohol to like (laughs) was amazing. And I watched that laughing hysterically knowing that you guys- Oh, I tagged you in it. I know. We were like, to Chris. (laughs) I was like, why didn't you guys ask me? Like, I told you to eat puffin. I didn't tell you to eat fermented shark. That stuff's no, but We were so disappointed to disappoint you <laughs> with the puffin that were like the only redemption. And guess who ordered it? Who? Not me, not Pete, not Meredith. Dylan next to me was like, we got to get the shark. And so he ordered shark for the table. And was it, shark huge? For the table. Was it like a huge portion? No, this is Thank the funniest goodness. part. It was like a tiny little, because they were like, oh, these stupid. Americans hopefully they thought we were Canadians honestly because that's the question that everyone asked and I'm like yeah Canadian (laughs) (laughs) but they give us this tiny little ramekin and it has like six toothpicks in it with these like teeny tiny little samples of shark which makes me feel better because like you know it's I like shark I love shark week um (laughs) and they give you a shot of what is it called Brennan's 
Brett, I don't know the exact, I can't. It's, it sounds, it's like their type of spirit, basically, which it's like actually, aqua vite. it's like, it's kind of nice. It's like a less bitey gin. It's like less shampoo-y gin. Um, I wouldn't consider I it shampoo-y. I, 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 used I do to not like gin. gin. No? But, no, it's actually the one, like, booze that I can't. Mm -mm. Anyway, so they give you a shot to chase the shark with. And all of us were like, I just had to send it like before anyone did it. Cause I was like, if I think about this for a second, it's like jumping off, you know, into water when you're scared. I was like, <laughs> like just ate the shark really quick. And then everyone was like, <laughs> and we ate the shark and then, you know, you chase it with this shot and Meredith was like, <laughs> the video of, of Meredith was priceless because she, she, she couldn't get the booze fast enough. The reaction to her, her oh, nostrils. She turned bright red. red. <laughs> it was, <laughs> it was it, an awesome. Video. I didn't have like the gag thing going, but it did taste like dirty, like rubber socks that were like soaked in like maybe formaldehyde. So my yeah. question to you is, is how do you know what dirty socks that make rubber <laughs> smell like formaldehyde taste like? I mean. So I talked about the secret of winning BWR is having <laughs> the dirty socks. <laughs> You're not one of those athletes that drink out of your shoes, right? After you win this. What is that? I saw that as like a thing. What That's is nasty. That? No. It's na nasty. Nasty. No, don't do don't do that. You don't, don't have to drink do out that. of your shoes. I mean, you couldn't drink out of your shoes after Oregon. At one point during uh, during Oregon, when I was riding on the pavement, I took off my shoes and poured a half a cup of sand out. Oh yeah. It back is, on. Uh your shoes aren't the same after a race, like. Five days, that's a hard, for everyone out there, I hope people are listening to like, and like getting, you know, tips and tricks, but really like the one thing, sign up for beat out or for Oregon Trail, like that. That was awesome. I, I don't know. I think that shit was maybe harder than Lead Boat. <laughs> I'm, I'm definitely wanting to go back. It's like adult summer camp. The yeah. best part is the camping. I think the camping definitely leads to that. Hopefully it won't be 112 next year. Oh my God. Oh, Chad, really? Like, I can't believe, I mean, I can, cause that dude is like the guy that puts it on. He's amazing. <laughs> amazing. I mean, honestly, like, sure I won, but like all I had to do is like go race. He was like organizing thousands of pounds of ice at backup. Like, I mean, Everything. he made a gnarly, like logistical nightmare happen amidst a heat wave in a pandemic. Yeah. Hello. That's why I meet, I mean, I, I already signed up for next year. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, I, I want to do it again. And what's yeah. really funny is if it wasn't for Henry and his magic pantyhose filled with ice, like, oh my God. Go to us and come running up behind, like literally moto up behind us, pull our jersey open, drop oh. the pantyhose with ice. If it wasn't for Henry, I think I would have died out there of heat stroke. A lot of people would have <laughs> perished, I think. Yeah, there was, there was definitely some moments out there. Oh, wait, sorry. Going back to the shark thing. Yeah. What was the gross thing you told me about shark? After I'm like describing eating it. Oh yeah, shark. Shark doesn't. Uh, yeah, shark exudes. Um, it has a lot of uric acid in it, like skate, so it exudes through its skin, its urine. So it definitely has a aroma. So really, we uh, we had pee pee socks. We had pee pee shark socks. <laughs> <laughs> That's so gross. Wait a second, I don't even want to comment. We're just gonna leave. we're gonna push that over to the side. Okay. So one of the things that's really interesting that you do, which is, you know, let's I mean you design your cool van exterior, you've, you know, you did the jersey, you did the bike, you rode Leadville on a metal bike, which most people aren't doing anymore. You rode an aluminum frame, which was so super fun. Cool. It was so cool. I'm not even just like my friend who works at Specialized, I saw her in the airport um after this last race and she was like actually Christopher Blevins sister um Kaylee Blevins who was also on that sweet elite team um and she's now going to med school um but she was like so how like really how was that like was it just like a marketing thing with specialized did they just not have a bike for you and I was like no I had a choice I wanted to ride the alloy frame I thought it was cool mainly because the people who designed that bike, it was not a custom painted bike for me. You could buy that one online. I just thought it was super dope. And it just ended up matching the bus and my kit 
perfectly, but it was so cool. I love, I also love riding that, racing that bike because a lot of the kids I coach with Devo, they race the, chis- or they ride on the chisel because it's a, you know, an alloy hardtail. It's not like a $10,000 S-Works bike that I don't think kids necessarily need to start on an S-Works, you know? And it's something that their parents can like upgrade if they're like into it. Like if they are really stoked on racing, like get a pair of carbon wheels if you want to save up for that. Or like you can like, there's steps to like upgrading a piece of equipment instead of just like, you know, starting with. Spending the full shadonky donk right off the bat to find out you don't really love it. And I think that's a really important point. Like it's not always about the equipment. No. You you build on yourself. It's like. Totally. Totally. The other day I said to somebody, you know, just because you ran your dog around the block twice doesn't mean you can go show up and win the Boston Marathon. You need to train <laughs> work towards these things, right? So whether yeah. it's where you have a starter bike and you build upon that, and as you get more okay. comfortable with it, you get more comfortable with the sport, you upgrade these parts. Yeah. Just like you said. I, and I honestly, I think that that hopefully is the way of the future. If anything, we've learned from these heat waves, these wildfires, the pandemic, like there are things happening in our world that we do have control over and you don't necessarily need new equipment every single year. The newest thing, you know, fashion industry is huge in this, you know, like we're actually trying to figure out how to make the bus biodiesel. And like, there are things, there's small things you can do. Like, do we need the newest thing or can we just make some upgrades? Like, like wasting is like a part of the the picture that I, you know, that drives me crazy. Like I'm stoked to have like hydro flask on board. Cause like now I like get to travel with like zero waste. Like we don't have, like I have people put my like salad in this like container thing. (laughs) Like, I mean, I look like a crazy person for sure, but hopefully it's more and more normalized of like, all right, let's like, using like two-year-old equipment is okay. Like we don't need the newest, shiniest thing. And I, I'm sure people are gonna be like hypocrite because like <laughs> I'm always raising it and I kind of am, it's a little hypocritical. <laughs> no, but I think it's a, it's a really valid point because not everybody needs to get the newest, like, you know, yeah. it's always about taking care of what you have, yes. have making it have yes. longevity. You, if sometimes there's things in life that if you spend more from the get go, mm-hmm. right, don't buy yes. something that's disposable, buy something that has longevity. Yeah, like the fast fashion thing that also like happens in, in cycling. Like, I know people like scoff at like super expensive bib shorts, but like if, if you're riding a ton, like buy something of quality, like there's a ton of really great high end brands out there that make stuff or like have a repair program. Like I love, I love that. I think Patagonia is leading the way for sure. For with sure. Like their worn wear stuff, like, but you know what companies are really catching on and like making, making that a thing. And like, I would say just like purchase with like good customer service. Like that is, that is like top of the line, like box you need to check. Like, do they have a good customer service program? Like, can you talk to somebody about if your gear breaks, la la la, you know, all, all of that. Plus lowering the barrier to entry in the sport. I think it's important to show that like, I don't know what I told my, what I told Specialized when they asked me if I wanted to do the alloy. And I was like, look, the difference between me winning that race or not winning or getting on the podium or not is not gonna be about the equipment that is going to be about like how I show up. And, oh, I want to tell you about the float tank thing I did before that. Yeah. Sorry. But I don't, I know that ADD. Yeah. We just remind me, remind me about that. So, you know, a lot of the things that you do, you have a, a philanthropy component that you work with and that's outride, correct? Yeah. And you want to talk a little bit about outride because I think it's really yeah. A lot of folks out there, um, you see, like, for instance, Pete Sagan outrides and people have a chosen thing that they choose to outride. And I think it's a really amazing organization that's based here in Northern California that you're a participant in. And there's multiple athletes all over the globe that participate in that. And and I think they're doing things that really um, that affect you and I dramatically, uh, our ADHD that 
you know, is a huge part of what we are and who we are that has yep. made us be the six, you know, given us the success that we've hoped for, but mm -hmm. also we have to learn to rein it in. And I think outright is a really great message. Yeah. It, and it's, it's an interesting program, like how it started, you know, Mike Sinyard has ADD and he wanted like a way to like give back into the community, like obviously from like a middle school and high school level, like making bike programs more accessible, you know, giving kids outlets in school to like get outside to do something to get rid of like a lot of this extra energy. And then it's kind of over the years transformed into this platform of like, you know, they use people like pros and ambassadors to the sport to share like the things in their life that they outride, the things that they use a bicycle to overcome, which I love that messaging. Cause at the end of the day, that's kind of like all of us find the bike in different ways and use it for different reasons. A huge reason I ride a bike is mental health for sure. And so I think we can do a blanket statement of that. I think a lot of, a lot of cyclists use it as a way to release energy, whether or not, you know, you are anxious, depressed, distracted whatever like it's a it's a great release and at one issue with cycling is that it there's a barrier to entry it is an expensive piece of equipment and so it's a grant program as well so like if you're a middle school I think it's just middle schools right now I need I can't remember I think you can also like apply for some grants for other programs um, so like if you're a high school or an, uh, a NICA league, you know, you can be, you can receive some money through the outright grant. Um, but they're really aiming at putting these programs um, in PE classes in schools. So like giving, you know, they donate, you know, 10, 20 bikes to a PE program in a middle school. Like I, I mean, I didn't, my dad rode bikes growing up, but like there was not, we had like dodgeball and tetherball. <laughs> Yeah, we had, we were pretty much the same thing. There it would be crazy yeah. to like get to like, I mean, ride a mountain bike for like your middle school PE class. And, and I hope like I can't wait to see like this has just started the last like five years. No, fewer like three, maybe three or four. Um, and it'll be cool to see like what kids like come up through these programs. And they're like, not just in like, mountain towns because like obviously like Devo Durango Devo like we're in the middle of the mountains like mountain biking is so accessible here if you're like I mean even if you're in Albuquerque like where I grew up like you have to drive to like there are mountain bike trails but like or in the Midwest like there's all these programs that like mountain biking isn't necessarily accessible but like riding a bike is like whether it's commuting or like going out with your friends like you know old school style, like paper route. <laughs> like I that doesn't, that. there's like, there's, that doesn't really exist anymore, really. Like there's, you know, the internet in everyone's pocket. And, you know, I, I do kind of worry about that, but it's cool to like, be able to like, see those programs in, in like middle schools all over the country. One of the things that I think has been a really hot topic right now is the equality of prize purse and right. women's and men's cycling. And I think, you know, I personally find that I think the women's events are way more fun to watch, way more intense, um, but also the camaraderie level is really, really high. Have you seen a dramatic change in that? Are you seeing, the, are you seeing it go in the direction that you and your fellow athletes uh, female athletes across the playing field have seen a, a, a positive change or are you seeing it wishy-wash? What, what are you seeing right now? Wait, say that again. Sorry. Did I freeze? That happens. The technology. Yeah. No um, <laughs> are you seeing with, in regards to women's cycling, the prize purse being equalized, but are you seeing the, what you and your fellow female athletes have been looking for, which is equal prize purse, equal, um, marketing equal uh, media and press relations. Are you feeling that that's hitting the point that it should be, or do you think it still has a long way to go? Oh man, we still have a long way to go. <laughs> I mean, I hate to be like negative about it. Cause I think there have been like really positive steps made for sure. Like there are, Oh, I would say all of the races that I've done 
have had equal payout, which like rewind like even five years ago, I don't think that that would have been the case, which like, I can't imagine lining up and, and we're doing the same distance, you know, like it's the, it's the same race out there. Um, and so like, actually when I won BWR, I got more money <laughs> than Pete Stetna that year. Like they had a bigger prize purse for the women than they did for the men. So that, I think we've made, and I can't speak to, to like roadside, like I don't really know those scenes. Like I think um, Trek Segafredo is the only like pro tour team that pays their women's salary equal to men. So we have a lot of work to do in that regard. Like there's a lot of pro like, and gosh, I'm sure like you'll have people comment on this and they're like, so-and-so team does this. Like, I, I hope there's more. That's just the one that I like not knowing very much about that world. So I think we have a lot of, a lot of work to do in, in that space as well. But then like the media coverage is tough because like, and we've seen some stuff recently, like there, we just get different coverage. Like they, they comment on different things in our race. Like and part of that is because they're, you know, there's a, a stacked like top of the field, like maybe the top 10, top 15, top 20, maybe is super competitive. And then there's like a significant drop off of like everyone after that, like, you know, they're not able to put everything in to, you know, being a professional cyclist. So they're like juggling motherhood, you know, full-time careers, like everything else that comes before cycling and then you know you have like the top five percent of us women are like you know like me and rose grant for example like even mariah the woman who got second at leadville she works at specialized like she has a full-time 40 hour a week i'm assuming job granted it's at a bike company and i i would hope that <laughs> she gets some leeway on that but like there's just there's not a ton of support coming so like there aren't enough women out there that have the support so like we can have like an extremely deep field of like professional women you know if that makes sense I don't know if I I just like like stumbled across like through well, I think that, that that's also a really relevant point I think I think it's just as interesting to hear about a mom Oh yeah, like look at Laura King. <laughs> and who's racing at that level. I think yeah. that shows so much. And to me, I I want to hear that story just as much yeah. as I want to hear it about it's just, the top yeah. guys duking it out. And that sh to me shows there's more going on on one side than there, you know, it's like- Yes. There needs yes. to be more of that inclusivity in, in, the, in, the, uh, in the media right now, sharing that appropriate information because that's going to inspire- another person and another person that says, yes. well, you know what? She just raced against Sarah and Serena and Rose. And, yep. you know, there's, you know, Laura King, you know, Laura King's a mom. She runs her own event. She's got a full time. And Rose is a mom. <laughs> and Rose is a mom. So like, yeah. those are the kind of things that I think are rad, right? Yes. But I also don't, I don't want to see the media focus on well maybe they could have done a little bit better if they weren't focusing more on their child like that's the mm -hmm. thing i never want to hear or never want to see i want to hear yeah. them focus on the positive aspects yes. of how hard and the decisions that they've made to get to the top of their game while being a mom while mm -hmm. being a full-time employee while being you a know, professional athlete that's so that's so interesting i'm glad that you brought this up because actually like what i what i want to clarify is i'm not saying i wish there were more like pro women who are able to just be cyclists that's actually like the complete opposite and you nailed it like women's racing is inherently different than men's if you look at the women's field like a lot of us have you know college degrees or like side careers or you know other other components that we're putting into our lives like from motherhood and phds to you know whatever like all of these other components there are, there are fewer women that are just purely a hundred percent athletes. And, and this is at by no means like throwing shade their way. Cause I, there's no, like, that sounds so hard to me. Like that sounds, ugh, all of it is really hard, <laughs> but 
you're totally, you're totally right. Like the women's field is just, it's so rich with these other components of these women's lives. Like there's so much else that goes on behind like crossing the the finish line or riding a bike. Like that's why I love going like at the last best ride, we had a women's brunch and we went like before the race and we went around and like, we learned like what, like what inspired people to get into cycling, like what they do for their jobs. And it was like all over the place. And it was so interesting because we all kind of connected, you know, sure about bikes, but like women are just like these multifaceted, like creatures and I think that that is the piece that I would love to see like more media stories like look at these incredible athletes that are performing at the highest possible level they also like you know like Rose has a daughter like (laughs) Laura has a daughter like I'd love to to hear about and not just motherhood like some women choose not to have children and that's great but also I was just talking to you know my sponsor at Specialized like if I decide to have children as a professional athlete, that is a really different decision for me than it is for like my male counterpart. Like that, that puts me off of a bicycle for a very long time. Just, I mean, not only with like pregnancy, but like breastfeeding and caring for an infant, like it looks so different for women. And I think that's why I go back to say women's racing is so different than men's. And I I personally find it really interesting and way more entertaining. So I, I, pretty much exclusively just like follow women's cycling like and then you have like on the world cup mountain bike level I don't know if any if you've been watching that wildly entertaining it is it is so awesome to watch those women compete on the world cup level and the speed is them. astronomical the the micro- and it's entertaining it's not just one wi- I mean no, it's all of them and it's, and it's flipping and flopping and who's ahead yes. and who's behind but also there's all these micro stories about who they are and what's going on in their lives. And I think yeah. that's really, really, really important. Yeah. And, and that's, I guess that's through <laughs> a million words that I just vomited out. That's what I'm trying to say is like the racing itself is really different and dynamic in a different way. And the camaraderie at the line is super different in like a really awesome way. <laughs> and then you also like, have all of these stories and like all of these different components that is a part of like you know our our story as an individual like I think it's it's super cool like I feel really lucky to be a woman in sport because you know it's something it's a way I've always like connected with other people and it and you know um I oh my god at at, uh Kika Randall she was at uh the last best ride and she's was on the gold medal winning team for Nordic racing at the Olympics and the story about that whole team having this amazing camaraderie and like the path that they had to the Olympics of working together towards this goal that only two of them was going to make this one team and you know, they worked together and they had like personality tests done. So they learned about each other because, you know, they raced for four months together, a chunk of time. Like they, they like ship off to Europe and do all of their like European racing and they're living together through the U S ski team. And they like had these personality tests done to like, okay, so-and-so does this after race, she needs some downtime. So-and-so like maybe needs some accolades, like you know, they learned their personalities and like they learned about each other and it just brought them like so closely together. And she said that like when they won the gold medal at the Olympics, it really was kind of just like the cherry on top of this experience that they got to have as a, as a team, as a unit. And they had worked their asses off physically, but also as this team component, you know? And I thought that that, like, I'm so excited to have connected with her And, you know, I look up to her as a mentor and she's also like a cancer survivor, a mother, like it's not just in cycling, like it's, it's across the board. Like it's such a cool thing, you know, to get to connect to these women that have these incredible stories and they're just incredible people. And I think that's what, that's what really is the bigger picture, right? There's more to somebody than just the bike and how fast they can go. Yes. So 
I have commanded a lot of your time today. We're going to do this quick <laughs> game that I do with everybody. Okay. So there is no wrong answer. There's a, a rapid fire of questions. So are you ready? Oh, goody. <laughs> All right. Coffee or tea? Coffee. Espresso or cappuccino? Cappuccino. <laughs> red or white wine? Ooh, red. Tequila or whiskey? Oh, that's a hard one. It used to be just whiskey for sure, a hundred percent. But now I think it's tequila, which is a weird shift. Those are very different. Tequila. Mm. I can't drink either. I can't drink anymore. <laughs> I don't know. That's a whole different right, I know. <laughs> so, um, pasta or noodles? What? What's the difference? Well, pasta, traditionally Italian noodles being uh, Asian noodles with like a rice noodle, oh. or ramen, or um, a dan noodles. dan noodle. Noodles? Yeah. Okay. <sighs> Hamburger hot dog. Oh, mm, hamburger. <laughs> Ketchup or mustard? Ew, mustard for sure. Okay, Dijon or deli mustard? Dijon. Good answer. <laughs> the last five, the last five folks have said ketchup and I've just cringed. I'm like, Ugh. I had some like homemade, like we went to like a really bougie restaurant in Snowmass. Oh my God. They had this thing called a billionaire margarita. It was $1,500. What the, I, what? I didn't order it. Really? I could have never understood why. You couldn't have swiped the swipe them <laughs> in your send your card. Uncle Sam, you can put this on Rafa's tab. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Rafa tab, please. Yeah, I'm sure that would but be they good. had good, they had like homemade ketchup, like house made, and it, it was good. I just don't love the sugar in it. It's like a I weird think that's sweet. the thing. Originally, yeah. ketchup was made to prevent scurvy. Does it have vitamin C? Yeah, tomato. So it was a, it was a scurvy for, for and, and, and ketchup was multiple different things. It wasn't always tomato. It was fruits. It was tons of different things. And it was made to survive the ship when you're crossing the ocean. I want to do another podcast with you where we only talk about food. Cause I, I like learning you. about all you of that anytime. <laughs> um, okay. Nigiri or sashimi? Ooh, sashimi. Okay. Sea urchin caviar. I like caviar more than sea urchin. I the sea urchin is a weird, like, <laughs> <laughs> like it's a weird, that's a, uh, that's a weird texture on my tongue. It tastes like a little bit of the vomit. <laughs> okay. Texture -wise. Chocolate or fruit? Say that again. Chocolate or fruit? Oh, chocolate. <laughs> okay. Milk chocolate or bitter chocolate? Ooh. Mm, I would say most of the time milk chocolate. It's interesting. That's such a, that's such a dependent. I get it, so many different answers on I that. I know. Like sometimes I'm really in the mood for like a bitter chocolate, but I would say like most of the time I'm just like, I want sugar. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oatmeal or yogurt for breakfast? Oh, mm, neither on race day. It's just shoving that into my gullet. Um, probably oatmeal, like a good, like grainy, mm. like yummy mm -hmm, with like I like the mixture of textures. Yogurt's just like, but <laughs> <laughs> it's like drinking like, <laughs> or like eating just like a normal like soup without like any, like I like a more than like a, I don't know if it's a bisque or a soup, but textures, you know. You like texture. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the last two, your favorite junk food. What's your favorite? I mean, does mac and cheese count? <laughs> I do well, are you making it from scratch or does it come from a box? No, I love Annie's mac and cheese. <laughs> I mean, you know, that's that's a guilty pleasure. There's nothing, you know, there is no bad. Or a double stuff Oreo. I love double stuff Oreos. Do you do you tear them apart and eat the stuffing or do you eat the whole Yeah, thing? I'm not a sociopath. <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny. Just a cookie at once. <laughs> wow. Wow. Oh my God. Or like dipping it in milk. Like I can't, I honestly, I don't enjoy Oreos as much without milk. Really? 
Mm -hmm. I like the, yeah, I like it. <laughs> okay, the last one, nachos or a quesadilla? Oh, that's tough, nachos. <laughs> Loaded with cheese and everything or? Oh, oh, yeah, if it's just like, yeah, I like all the different, like bougie tacos, I love. Who doesn't like? Who doesn't like good tacos? Because you get—it's like it's like a game of Jenga too. Like putting all the stuff <laughs> on it. Who like, do I want? It's like a hot mess, right? Everybody loves that big heaping pile of hot mess. Well, the only bummer is like when you pull out the chip that's just a chip, and you're just like, "What is this garbage?" <laughs> <laughs> that's a really good. That's why I love to toss when I do nachos. I feel it's important to toss everything together. Then you're a nacho it. tosser. <laughs> oh my god. New band name, call it. <laughs> nacho My new band, Nacho <gasps> Tosser. Uh -oh. Canadian Nacho Tossers. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna show up in Lucha Libre masked and throw nachos at the audience. <laughs> we can do god, that. I wish I could play music. <laughs> that I cannot do. I'm probably the most musically inclined uh, human ever. Well. Sarah, I can't say thank you enough for taking time out of your crazy schedule. I know you've got thank training. You. You've got a couple events coming up still. I think oh, yeah. you're headed to uh, Stetna's event, if I'm correct. Yes. Are you going? I will not be there. I'm actually cooking a charity event for oh. my health at Staglin Vineyard. So um, really. That's really rad. Of course you are. I'm super this excited. This is why we're friends. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm bummed that I can't be there with everybody. But, uh, you know, we're going to definitely make some magic happen. I hope I get to see you very soon. <laughs> yes, we're going we're gonna to have some fun and, and ride some bikes. And you can show me how to ride a hardtail with a... Uh, oh, my God. Put a dropper on before that. <laughs> I have a dropper post. I do. I have a dropper Put post. On your bike. I, I'm just weird like that, okay? I got to... No, that's what they call old school. I am old. Sarah, I am cool. old. I said old school. I know, but I said I'm old. I'm 49 <laughs> years old. I mean, come on. I I started mountain biking when there were still cantilevers, and I remember the big, <laughs> oh my God, V brakes, they're awesome. Which is why you're not putting a dropper post on your bike. You fit a stereotype, my friend. <laughs> well, I, you have to remember, I did go from riding a single speed to learning how to ride gears. So. I know, that's so. We need to do another podcast and I'm going to interview you. <laughs> I don't want my own podcast, but I will interview you on your podcast. <laughs> no, that'll be so weird. <laughs> it would actually be pretty funny, I'm sure. But Julie, the, I, would I mean, I think a lot of people would love to learn about you and like all of the, the craziness you have had in your life. My weirdness. Yeah, I'm a weirdo. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll stick with hiding behind my my uh, my curtain of weirdness. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, everybody, if you want to check out Sarah, make sure you follow her on her Instagram, which is Sarah under, what is it? Sarah underscore Sturmy, S-T-U-R-M-Y. <laughs> there we go. That's good that she remembers. It was a lot of pulling deep to get that answer out of her. Uh, make sure you check out her Wahoo Frontiers video oh, yeah. as well as the BWR video with her on it, which is pretty funny. The one thing we did not talk about, which we're going to end off with, and then I'm going to hit that button to stop recording, is her knee to pay and the back of her <laughs> And on that note, we are going to hit goodbye. <laughs>